We talked about service industries in the first four chapters because they were the simplest. We wanted to get you well grounded in the accounting principles before we added complications. We were um, service industries that r render services in order to earn revenue. We were real estate agents, we were golf courses, we were uh, airlines, we were laundromats, we were movie theaters, we were doctors and lawyers. We're adding the complication of goods. We're becoming a merchandising concern, holding goods for sale in order to attempt to earn a profit. And the unique thing about this is that you know a lot about this information because you've shopped. Yes? Every person in the room has been to a store and bought something. You've shopped. So you know the point of view of buying goods to consume. We need to know both points of view. In order to hold goods for sale, we need to be able to buy them and put them on the shelf, but then we need to open the doors and invite customers in and help them make their selections and run them through the checkout line and earn revenue from selling those goods as well. And that's the topic. Both points of view, from the buyer's point of view and the seller's point of view, you, you should be able to relate to this because of your real life experiences. We're, we're not going to have to imagine as much we've experienced it. There are two ways that we can account for inventory. They are periodic and perpetual. And we're going to do both in the next two weeks. Periodic inventory means that we keep up with the level of inventory occasionally. Periodic inventory has been the one that we have used historically the most. It's the easy Er, it's the easier of the two. Um, it's the least costly. It's the one we had to use because of the circumstances we're in. Times have changed. Perpetual inventory means that we keep up with the level of inventory all the time. The accounting records always disclose the amount of inventory that we have on hand. Now, that's not some magic trick that takes a sophisticated accounting system to accomplish that. It's technology that makes the difference. We have used periodic inventory procedures historically because we didn't have the technology to do it any other way. Historically speaking, perpetual was reserved for certain few kinds of industries that had high price goods, that had low volume, that could invest the time and effort to keep up with them. Technology changed everything. Uh, I remember when barcodes appeared on products. My wife and I had a standing joke for years, it seemed, that we never thought we'd see barcodes used in our lifetime because they appeared on all these products, but no stores were ever using them. If I pose the question to you today, to think of a business that doesn't use barcodes, you'd have to think long and hard to come up with a few examples, wouldn't you? We've seen them used so much in our lives now that we hardly can imagine life without them. Technology changed everything. We can now use perpetual procedures in industries that we wouldn't have even thought about it years ago. So the business model has shifted some. Perpetual has become the norm. Periodic has become the exception. And that's the way we're presenting it to you. We're starting with perpetual procedures this week. We want to get you well grounded in inventory concepts, accounting for the goods that we plan to sell to others. And next week, the handout and the presentation are spin-offs of this week. 
bring your red pen. The handout next week takes this one with the answers all filled in and we add it. We just go through and see the changes that periodic inventory procedures require of us. We're learning perpetual this week. All the more reason that you should learn it well because we're building on it. The theme between now and the next test is inventory, merchandising, goods, accounting for the goods. In three weeks, in three chapters, and actually it's two chapters that we take three weeks to cover, we're going to talk about this one topic. Learn it as we go along. Don't wait until the end. Don't wait until next week to learn this week's. We're trying to build on this week's. This is the foundation I'd like you to know so that you could apply it. We're talking about perpetual procedures this week. Let's talk a little about the new things that we might encounter today and this week. I've got some new accounts to present to you. They'll all be asset liability, capital revenue, expense accounts. You know the model. And we just need to incorporate these new accounts into our prior knowledge. We've got some new terms. It's a little bit of a pun. There are vocabulary terms. How are we going to talk? But there are new terms of sale. The agreement that the buyer and the seller make in the transaction we call terms of sale. So that's really what I'm talking about. We've got new transactions, obviously. I've already addressed. We're going to be a buyer. We're going to be a seller. We need to know what entries we make to buy the good, perhaps return some, to put them on the shelf, to sell them eventually. We need to know both points of view. There are some source documents. Remember the accounting cycle? Business transactions create source documents. We ought to talk about the documents that business uses to provide evidence that these transactions have occurred. And in this electronic environment in which we're operating, those have changed, obviously. We would expect that. That doesn't mean that there's not the need for what that document has served historically. We still need to know the format that that document chooses. I've mentioned it three times at least today. Point of view is very important. You could become very confused. You could give nonsense journal entries if you don't learn a way to adopt the right point of view and consistently look at that transaction from that point of view and then look at it from the other point of view on another occasion. We need to know who we are. Are we the buyer or are we the seller? And we're going to be both. These changes affect the income statement. We need to know how to tweak the income statement just a bit to adequately communicate the events of the business. We need to know how to reformat it, include these new transactions in the income statement. And we're going to touch on that today, too, and it's in your homework this week. So let's talk about some of the new accounts. This one's new in more ways than one. Since the beginning of my teaching career, a long, long time ago, when the dinosaurs were still on the earth, we've called this merchandise inventory. Merchandise inventory. If I slip up sometimes and say merchandise inventory in your presence, it's because this old habit is hard to break. I suppose you can teach an old dog new tricks. We'll see how this works out. The new name of the account in the 10th edition of this book is Inventory. It's a good name. I like it. Simplified. Inventory represents the goods we have for sale. The goods that we plan to sell to other people. It's not supplies that we plan to use. It's not equipment that we plan to use. It's not the building in which our store resides. It's inventory. Do we need to make a fast trip to Walmart mentally? Do I need to describe that or can you see it? See it? It's a quick trip store with shelves full. It's Walmart with shelves full. All those items that are held for sale are inventory and accounted for in this account called inventory. In your note taking guide it said merchandise inventory. 
scratch out the word merchandise. The name of the account is inventory in this book. It's an asset. Its balance is debit. It goes on the balance sheet. It's real. It's not closed. We carry it over from year to year. Under perpetual procedures, we need a way to keep up with this all the time. If we buy things, we need to update this account. If we sell things, we need to update this account. Perpetual means all the time. At any one point in time, we should be able to go to a computer terminal, enter the account number for this account, and have the balance of the account pop up on the screen right that minute. <coughs> it's perpetual inventory. Our job is to account for inventory at cost. Have you heard me use the word before? Yes or no? Cost. Cost is a really, really important concept in accounting. It's a concept that runs throughout the balance sheet. We attempt to account for assets at cost, and this is no exception. Cost is not only what you pay for the product itself, but cost is also all the other things related to that to get it to you and ready for you to use, or in this case, ready for you to sell. For instance, somebody's got to pay to move these goods from place to place. The freight charges that we pay to acquire these goods are part of the cost. That's part of the lesson this week is what to do with freight. And it's part of the lesson today. We'll cover it. We're talking about new accounts. For a long, 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 long time, we've called this account sales. In this edition, in this chapter, they call it sales revenue. I kind of like it. It's funny that the other one is shortening the expression and this is lengthening the expression. I like rent expense, salaries expense, depreciation expense, miscellaneous expense because they're easy to classify. They're all expenses. expenses. If we called this sales revenue, surely you wouldn't have an issue with what it was. It's a revenue account. It's the account that replaces the one you know best, service revenue. We called it service revenue in the first four chapters when we were a service industry. The book's going to call it sales revenue from now on. I'm going to go the other way on this one. I'm thinking we might call this one sales and save a little breath. Is that all right with y'all? Would you know what sales was if we just called it sales? Yes or no? Yes. Can we reach an agreement right now that it's okay to call it sales in your homework, sales in class, sales in your practice, sales on a quiz, sales on the exam? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Let's call it sales. What kind of an account is sales? Everybody said? Revenue. It's revenue. That makes its balance credit. That makes it go on the income statement. That makes us close it in which step of closing entries? In the first step of closing entries, we're going to close sales. It's a revenue account where we ring up the revenue that we earn at the cash register, put the items in a bag and smile at the customer and hand it to them and say, thanks, come back to see us. Y'all with me here? To have those goods off the shelf, in the shopping cart, in the bag, out the front door, in the trunk, is a good thing. That's why we're in business. We're in business to see those goods produce revenue. And here's where we record our reward. We earned revenue. We're going to, we're going to credit sales. Now what happens when the customer examines those goods and finds that they're not quite up to their specifications. They didn't fit. They're the wrong color. They're scratched. They're dented. Whatever the calamity is, the customer decides they don't want them anymore. They bring them back to us. We've got a special account for that. It's called sales, returns, and allowances. The situation I just described is a return. 
You've done it. You take the goods back to the store. The store gives your money back or gives you credit on the account or gives you store credit or some other resolution to keep you happy to make you want to come back and shop there again. We're the store. This is the point of view we're looking from. Then we're granting that reduction in our revenue. We didn't earn quite as much as we thought we did. Sales returns and allowances is contra sales. Drawing is contra capital. Accumulated depreciation is contra asset. Sales returns and allowances is contra revenue. Contra revenue. Its normal balance must be debit. Contra accounts go on the financial statements right beside the amount, the account they're connected with. Sales returns and allowances is just part of the debit side of sales. Sales returns and allowances is closed. In which step? Did you just read it to me off the handout or did you give any thought to that? In the second step, we close nominal accounts that have debit balances. When we name the four steps in closing entries, you'd be tempted to say expenses in the second step. But here's an example of something that cl gets closed in the second step of closing entries that's not an expense. We close sales returns and allowances in the second step. I've discussed a return. Let's talk about an allowance. You sell another company some of your goods and they find those goods to be unacceptable, <clears throat> dented, scratched. They want to return all of them. You talk them into reducing the price a bit but allowing them to keep them. You don't have the goods to replace them. There would be shipping charges to get those back and ship the new ones. They need them right away, whatever the situation. You make them happy by reducing the price that you've already recorded. You thought you earned that much in revenue, but you reduce the revenue that you earn by granting them an allowance. They keep the goods. You just don't earn as much revenue as you thought. Do you understand the difference between a return and an allowance? Say yes or no. Yes. We account for them in the same account. Sometimes we grant others a discount if they pay promptly. Having people buy on credit from us and not pay us for a long time causes problems. We have to pay for these goods that we're selling. We have to pay the rent. We have to pay salaries. We have to pay taxes. We have to pay all sorts of things. And when our customers don't pay us promptly, that cash shortage causes a problem. To encourage people to pay promptly, we sometimes grant them a cash discount. I wish you'd write in the margin, a cash discount. There's no blank to put it in. The cash discount that we record, we record in different accounts depending on our point of view. Are we the buyer or are we the seller? When we grant a cash discount as the seller, it reduces the true amount of revenue we earn. We record that in an account called sales discount. It's sales discount from the seller's point of view. It's contra sales. It's helping the other account take the place of things that should decrease sales. It's a reduction in sales. It's a cash discount recorded in an account called sales discount from the seller's point of view. Now, what if I wanted to know the true amount of revenue I earned? If I combine all these accounts in one net number, how would I net them? This number, subtract this number, subtract this number, would be the true amount of revenue I earned, yes or no? Yes. We call that net sales. You'll need to know it someplace else. It seems pretty obvious right this minute, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yes. Net sales. Sales minus sales returns and allowances and sales discounts 
is called net sales. Here's how it might look on an income statement. A good heading, all the revenue we've earned from the sales account. Some of you never got to hear in class that the columns on financial statements are not called debit and credit. There's a little out of class lesson on the class website about using columns to display financial information. They're debits and credits on the journal entry when we post them to the account on the trial balance in every column on the worksheet. When we lift those numbers off the worksheet to display them on the financial statement, they're numbers. They're not debits and credits anymore. We don't want to show it to other people with the burden of them having to understand debits and credits. They're just columns for displaying information. When I had a calculation to make, I moved over to this column. I summed the two contra accounts. I brought the result back. That's the sum of the two contra accounts. And that's subtracted from sales to get net sales. Our income statements will change a bit as we provide more and more information, especially for merchandising concerns. Let's talk about another term, a real life term. When Dr. Green became dean, we invited him to come to the Accounting Society to speak during that first semester he was here. And he used the expression P&L maybe 10 or 15 times in the presentation. He's a marketing guy. Who's had a class from Dr. Green yet? Hands up. It will be your privilege to be under his teaching. He's a, a, a dynamo. He's well-versed, he's got lots of experience, he's passionate about sharing his experiences and um, his expertise with you. In the presentation, it was P&L this and P&L that and P&L this and P&L that. And I'm sitting there thinking, nobody in the room knows what a P&L is except <laughs> about three of us. P&L is the world's abbreviation for profit and loss statement. It's been called an income statement about 40 years. But P&L was so ingrained in society, in our culture, that business people don't call it an income statement in the real world. They call it a P&L. Where do you eat? At Saga? Yes or no? Do they have a sign that says Saga, that direction? No. Is there a sign on the door that says Saga? No. It hasn't been called Saga in about 40 years. Yet we still call it Saga. Are y'all with me or not? This is an income statement, officially. But it's a crying shame when you get out of the class and somebody at your work says, hand me that P&L over there, and you don't know what to pick up to hand them. Go get me a P&L. Where's last month's P&L? That's the way the world talks. That may be the last time you hear it in here, but I wanted you to hear it so you'd be prepared for real life. An income statement is often referred to as a P&L. There are new accounts that we're going to encounter. Sales, sales returns and allowances, sales discounts are all revenue related. We bought these goods to sell them. We need an account called cost of goods sold. We choose words to communicate in account. Some of you have the misconception that we take the old Scrabble game and pour the letters in a fishbowl and put our hand in the fishbowl and stir the letters all around and choose out letters randomly and then try to pronounce them. Cost of good sir. No, that's not the way we did it. We tried to describe, tried to get an expression that would be descriptive of what happened. We bought the goods to put them on the shelf so that customers would find them attractive, so customers would make their selections, put them in the shopping cart, go by the cash register, allow us to earn revenue. Thank you very much, come back and see us. When those goods get off the shelf and in the trunk of the car, that's a good thing. Yes or no? Yes. That's cost of goods sold. Having an asset on the shelf becoming an expense in the trunk of the car is a good thing. 
when they take those goods home with them, not steal. When they take those goods home with them, having allowed us to earn revenue, that's a good thing. Cost of goods sold, but it's an expense. It's the expense of those assets helping us earn revenue. Those assets helping us earn revenue at the cash register make them become cost of goods sold. An expense that those goods provided us. Here's the same income statement you saw a few minutes ago. We knew this information down through net sales. From net sales, we're going to subtract something called cost of goods sold. And on a multi-step income statement, we show a subtotal right there called gross profit. In Dr. Green's mentality, we would call this vocabulary, I should have said, we'll call this gross margin. Want to write a parenthetical note out of the margin? You could. Gross margin, sometimes people refer to it. The excess of the revenue we earn over the expense we incurred for the good itself. Let's make up an example. Let's pretend I paid $30 for this shirt. Did the store from which I bought this shirt pay $30 for it? Say yes or no. no. Let's pretend, just to make the math easy, they paid $20 for it. When they sold it to me, how much revenue did they earn? Say something. <laughs> no. I heard the wrong word. You thought it, you knew where I was going, and I tricked you. When they sold the shirt to me, how much revenue did they earn? $30. Yes? yes. What was cost of goods sold? $20. Speak up! $20. Gross profit? Yes. It's that simple. Gross profit on that simple transaction would be $10. And from that, on the income statement, we'll deduct expenses. That's not that different from what you've done in the first four chapters. We'll get net income. Gross profit, the excess of the revenue earned over the expenses you incurred. We need to slay around some new vocabulary. We have been already. We need to be specific about some of the new things and the way we talk. But we also need to be specific about the agreement that we make between the buyer and the seller. The agreement that we make between the buyer and the seller needs to include some provision about the cost incurred to move these goods from one place to another, the freight. Somebody is responsible, and we need to know up front who's responsible to pay the freight. Business uses the terms FOB shipping point and FOB destination to describe that. One of them means the buyer pays, one of them means the seller pays. We need to know which is which. Now, FOB stands for freight on board, technically. I'd like to get you to relate to it by describing it as free on board, because I think you understand free, don't you? Free means you pay or you don't pay. You don't pay. So when we think about free on board, that means that person doesn't pay, the other person does. Does that make sense? Now, there are two possibilities here. It's either where it starts, the seller's place of business, or where it's going, the buyer's place of business. Which of those is which? Shipping point and destination. The shipping point is the seller's place of business. The destination is the buyer's place of business. You ought to be able to figure it out by now. Free on board at the seller's place of business would mean Mac, the truck driver, backs up to the dock, loads all the goods on his truck, expects to be paid, but he's not. You're with me or not? They were free at the seller's place of business FOB shipping point says it's the buyer's responsibility to pay. Let's go there and see what happens. Mac heads off to the new place of business to deliver these goods. Mac arrives at the destination, backs up to the dock. He took a risk of his sweat equity to load the truck, his time to get across town or across the country, his diesel to use to get there. Max in a risky position right this minute. He's sure hoping by the time he gets this, these goods unloaded that he'll get paid. And sure enough, 
the buyer paid Mac. Who pays the freight when it's FOB shipping point? Buyer or seller? Say something. Buyer. The buyer does. Pretend you didn't see the illustration. Pretend it's brand new. Pretend you don't have any clue. Let's practice one more time. Who pays the freight when it's FOB destination? Don't blurt it out. You don't know. We're pretending. Who pays the freight when it's FOB destination? Well, if it's free on board when it gets there, it must be free on board when it gets there because the seller paid Max delivering the goods already having been paid. Don't you suppose Mac likes it that way better? Do you remember the risk I described a little bit ago? This is a whole lot less risk for Mac. But I'm not thinking that the seller and the buyer are all that concerned about Mac. They're concerned about dealing with one another in the agreement that they make. Which do you suppose is the most common? FOB shipping point or FOB destination? <coughs> Have a hunch. Shipping. Shipping. FOB shipping point or FOB destination is the most common? Guess. Shipping. Shipping. It's shipping point. That's from your experience. Visit a new car showroom in your imagination right this minute. Walk around the car and then stop on the driver's side where the window sticker's stuck on the back window. Look at all the accessories, but look right down the bottom of the list where it describes the freight charges from where that car was manufactured to Tulsa in that showroom. If you buy that car, you're going to pay the freight. Consider a shopping channel on TV. So you get sucked into the presentation like I do sometimes, and when you decide to buy that good off of TV, they're going to put shipping charges at the bottom. It's not going to cost you what you thought it was. It's going to be a little more. Are you with me right this minute? Online shopping. You choose to buy something on the internet. You think it's going to be this price but you're going to add on shipping charges to get it to you. All of those are FOB shipping point. The seller doesn't pay, the buyer does. We experience that in real life. One of the other new terms of sale, agreements that the buyer and the seller into, enter into, is what about this cash discount that I, that I mentioned earlier? There's a, a code that goes along with transactions sometimes that's expressed this way. This reads 210 net 30. 210 net 30, each component of which has meaning. This means that if you pay us on time, we will allow you a 2% discount. If you pay us within 10 days, we'll allow you to pay us 2% less. Now, that's a sweet deal. It is considered to be a sound business practice to take advantage of discounts like this. You think 2% is no big deal. 2% for 10 days is a big deal. If you could get 2% every 10 days, that'd be huge annually. When my wife goes in a store looking for bargains and they have a 10% off rack or a 15% off rack, she walks right past them. It takes 40 or 50% to get her attention. You're with me here? 2% sounds like pocket change that we're just not interested in. I'm telling you, we are. Over time, this can add up. It is considered to be a sound business practice to take advantage of cash discounts if you can. 2% off if paid within 10 days. If you don't pay within 10 days, then the whole thing, we describe that as net, the whole thing, the original balance, is due within 30 days. 210 net 30. There are some other ways to say it. There are some other agreements into which we could enter. Like, say that one to me. A 1% discount if paid within 10 days, the whole thing's due in 60 days. Say that one. Come on, speak out, go. <laughs> Y'all couldn't even say the first part. We're worried about the last part. You're, you just quit on me. That's 210 net end of month. The buyer and the seller agree to terms. We ought to know when to expect payment. 
If we're the seller, we want to pay on time. If we're the buyer, we want to know when to start getting upset that they haven't paid us yet. Y'all with me here? Maybe it's no matter when you buy it during the month, it's due at the end of the month. How about this one? This says net end of month. How much discount do you get? That says to everybody, we don't give discounts. Do you understand what we're talking about here? This is the way business talks. It's the language of business. We need to know some of this. Let's talk about new transactions into which we're going to enter. I bet you could figure out some of this logically if you just think. You'd rather me tell you this first time. But if you'd get just a little bit ahead of the curve and think about them first and guess first and get them right, homework's going to be a lot easier. Everything else is going to fall into place. What if we read a transaction in the book? What if we experienced a transaction in real life that said, purchase merchandise from seller, FOB shipping point, 210 net 30, $1,000. First question of you is, who pays the freight, buyer or seller? Buyer pays the freight. And who are we right now? One of the, who are we right now? You can tell with verbs, you're already struggling with it. I heard some wrong answers. It says at the top we're the buyer in the heading, okay? But it, it's not going to say that in a homework problem. You're going to have to read the homework problem and see the words and from the words decide on which point of view you're viewing this transaction. The verbs are going to give it away. Say the first word in blue. Say it. Are we the buyer or the seller? Buyer. We're the buyer. From the buyer's point of view, we're going to debit inventory and credit accounts payable. Now, how did I know it was accounts payable? We've been accustomed to relying on the expression on account. I didn't say on account in this entry on purpose because I thought it was redundant. To say 210 net 30 and on account is saying it twice. If you say 210 net 30, that's the same as on account, but more. Now we know there's a discount. Now we know when it's due. 210 net 30 said on account. Are you with me right this minute? Say yes or no. Yes. Yes. Purchase merchandise on account. Debit inventory, an asset. We have it. It's ours. We owe for it. Credit accounts payable. What about the discount? Should we record the discount now? No. And the right answer is no, but let's talk about why. Why? I'd like to say if you were lost at Disney World or you were lost in a hospital or you were lost in an office building or if you were lost on the first floor of the LRC, and don't say you've never been lost on the first floor of the LRC. If you haven't, if you're a freshman and you haven't been here long enough. I went to the first floor of the LRC the other day. I've been here 39 years. And I got lost on the first floor of the LRC last week. <laughs> it's the truth. I found my way out, but I got lost. Oh, okay, if you were lost at one of these places, don't tell, don't tell me you'd get out the GPS on your phone, okay? Please. <laughs> Please. How, how, what would you do? Ask for directions. If you were female, men don't do that. <laughs> or so we're told. I don't mind asking for directions if I have to. There's nobody around. Map. map. Thank you very much. You find the map on the wall someplace. And when you find the map on the wall someplace, what do you look for on the map? Ah, there you go, there you go. The you are here thing. So let's talk about the timeline. This transaction started October the 4th and payment was due in 30 days. But if we pay on time, we get to take the discount. Now the question is, where are we on the map, on the timeline? We are here. We just recorded the original transaction and the question I asked you was, what about the discount? Do we record the discount here? Hello? You knew the answer when you hadn't been told, and now I've told you and you don't know the answer. Do we take the discount here? 
No, we take the discount, we record the discount when we know whether or not we've earned it, whether we deserve it or not. We're going to deal with the discount when and if we pay on time. When we record the original transaction, we don't know that we deserve it. No, you don't take the discount at the time you buy the goods, you take the discount at the time you pay for them on time. So, Matt, the truck driver, wants to be paid. We're the buyer. It's FOB shipping point. We're supposed to pay the freight. If we pay the freight, we're going to debit inventory. Surprise, surprise. This is perpetual inventory. The concept we're walking out right this minute is cost. The cost of these goods is not the invoice price, but also includes other costs that you would incur. We paid him on the spot. Matt, the truck driver, wants to be paid. We debit inventory under perpetual procedures. It becomes part of the cost of the product that we're producing. So let's say that we bought some of these goods and we've decided that we didn't like them. They were defective. They didn't meet our specifications. We're sending them back. If you give the goods back, we need to undo the original transaction. Look up here a second. Have you ever seen me do this before? It was my way of trying to get you to see what a reversing entry was. And that's not what I'm trying to do really right this minute, but if you wanted to relate to it that way, we need to look back. It's good advice. With all these transactions coming in us from two different points of view, buyer and seller, one of the things that could be a calming influence in your life and could increase the chances that you got the entry right was to look back at the original transaction. We debited inventory and credited accounts payable originally. You can look back at your handout. I can't show you on the screen. It's that transaction that we need to undo. We don't have to pay for them. We're going to reduce accounts payable. We don't have them anymore. We're going to decrease inventory. This entry is the opposite of the original one. You didn't look back as I'm trying to get you to. I wanted you to see that this is the opposite of the original transaction to make this one easier for you. We don't have the goods and we don't have to pay for them. Now, what if we pay for these goods within the time period? When we pay for these goods on time, we're going to credit cash because we're paying cash. We're going to debit accounts payable for the full amount. Let's take a look at that. I've got me a T account going here. The original invoice price was $1,000, but we just returned 200 of them. Right this minute, we owe $800. That $800 we're going to pay in full, meaning we don't owe any of it anymore. But the check that we actually write is going to be for less than that because we're paying on time. $800 times 2% is $16. I could use an auditor. Yes? I get to write the check for an amount less than that. I'm writing the check for $784. I've kind of hinted at this script before, haven't taught it to you until this moment. When things like this happen in class, you're going to hear me say, but I thought debits and credits had to eat. To which you're going to respond, they do. Meaning, they do have to eat. And I'm going to glance at this entry again and say, but they don't. Meaning, right this minute they don't, what are you going to do about it, Buster? They don't. And you're going to say, they will. <laughs> and I'm going to say, when, and ask for one of you to volunteer and tell me how to get us out of this mess. Let's practice. I'm looking at this entry, and I'm thinking, but I thought debits and credits had to equal. <coughs> that was wimpy. But I thought debits and credits had to equal. They do. They don't. They will. they will when, and you would offer, no, just say now, that's not good enough. <laughs> say what you're going to debit or credit. Say what amount you're going to use. Explain it to me. I'll do it this time. This is lecture. I'm going to credit inventory. That might be a surprise to you. I'm going to credit inventory because I'm carrying out the cost principle. 
I didn't really pay $800 for these goods. If I looked over in inventory, it'd say $800 was the cost. And it's not. I really paid $784. So I'm going to reduce, this is perpetual. I'm going to reduce the inventory account by the discount that I took. Let's be, let's see what happened in the inventory account. There's the original entry. There's the freight charges. We sent some goods back and reduced that account by $200. We paid for them on time and took the discount. In the inventory account, 1,000 plus 100 minus 200 plus minus 16, we now have a balance of $884. That is the cost of the goods we bought. These goods on hand, on the shelf, in the building, cost us $884. You're going to have to remember your question. I'll answer it after class, okay? I'm a little time squeeze here. So, we want to know cost. Give me two minutes to describe some seller's point of view transactions to you. What if we read a transaction? What if we experienced a transaction that said, we sold goods off the shelf to buyer, FOB shipping point, 110 net 30 for $100. Who pays the freight when it's FOB shipping point? Say something. Who are we? We're the seller. Are we going to have to deal with freight this time? No. But we're selling on account 110 net 30. So let's debit accounts receivable. They didn't pay us. Let's credit sales. The book calls it sales revenue. We agreed to call it sales. For the amount that we earned in revenue, it was a $100 transaction. At the time we record debiting accounts receivable and crediting sales, we should also consider the potential that we have for granting a cash discount. The question is, what about the discount? Should we record the discount at the point of sale? Well, we kind of considered this from the buyer's point of view a few minutes ago. We talked about, have you been lost someplace and finding a map and finding the you are here on the map? If we look at the timeline of this transaction, it originated October the 4th. We've got the potential of receiving cash from the customer on the 14th or receiving the full amount from the customer on November the 4th. And the question is, where's the little X marking you are here on the timeline? At the point of sale, we don't know whether the customer is going to pay us on time. At the point of sale, debit accounts receivable credit sales is a, all we know. We won't know about the cash discount until the 14th when the customer might pay us on time. So we're going to have to wait until the 14th to know whether or not the customer has paid on time and deserves the cash discount. So debit accounts receivable credit sales is all we can do. And I'm about to tell you something really important. Not as if everything else I've told you is not important, but here's a real common mistake. There are two things going on at the cash register. When you walk through the checkout line, you're the customer, and you stand there watching the clerk go bleep, 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 bleep. You all with me or not? You think there's one thing happening. They're going to tell you how much you owe. But I need you to come around behind the counter. I need you to be the bleeper. I need you to be the business. We're selling these goods. Two things are happening. We are earning revenue. We are incurring a cost and expense. When those goods were on the shelf, they were assets. As they pass by the checkout counter, bleep, 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 they're becoming an expense. We need to debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory. We don't have these goods. These goods became an expense. We're going to debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory for the cost. And that's the beauty of this perpetual inventory system that we use. We take it for granted. We have the technology. Somebody has to make the computer work. The computer has to know this is the good barcode. The computer has to know this good costs $60.
to remove that item from inventory and to, to call it an expense. Now, the common mistake you make is trying to combine these entries somehow. The most common mistake I see is debit accounts receivable credit inventory. Debit accounts receivable for 100, credit inventory for 60 doesn't compute. Did y'all get what I just said? It takes two distinct entries. One to record the revenue, one to record the expense that you incurred. Let's consider the last three entries that needed to be made on the handout from Monday's lecture. I think when time ran out, we were considering issued a credit memo to buyer for goods returned, $20. If we issue a credit memo, that's the opposite of an entry we've made previously. Remember the advice I gave you? Look back. If you look back, there's a greater chance that you'll be able to maintain the, point of, the same point of view and choose the correct entries from the seller's point of view in this case to record that transaction. The original entry was debit accounts receivable credit sales. This entry should debit sales returns and allowances to decrease sales and credit accounts receivable for the retail sales price of the goods being returned to us. In this case, that's $20 debit sales returns and allowances will decrease sales. Sales returns and allowances is contra sales. It's like the debit side of the sales account. Debit sales returns and allowances to reduce sales and credit accounts receivable. Now if it takes two entries to record a sale, one for revenue and one for the expense that we're incurring at the point of sale, it should also take two entries to record a return. We've recorded one that's the opposite of the revenue. We should also record the other that's the opposite of the expense that we incur at the cash register. Look back. Originally, we debited in that entry. We debited cost of goods sold and credited inventory. We need to do the opposite of that entry the second entry to record a return of merchandise to us would be to debit inventory and credit cost of goods sold. We're going to debit inventory here assuming that these goods are in good enough condition that they can be resold. If they were just the wrong color, then let's put them back on the shelf and sell them to another customer. If they're defective in some way, if they're broken, if they can't be sold, then that's not the right alternative here but we're assuming that they were just the wrong color. So we put them back on the shelf, debit inventory, and credit cost of goods sold. We didn't incur that expense after all. We'll incur that expense when those goods are sold later. One last entry to consider. Receive the balance due within the discount period. We sold goods to a customer on account. They've returned some goods to us, and now they're paying for us on time. Let's consider how much they owe us. The original transaction on account was for $100. They, recorded, they returned $20 to us. At the moment, they owe us $80. And we're willing to get rid of everything that they owe us by collecting that cash from them within the discount period. We're going to debit cash for the amount we receive in cash. We're going to credit accounts receivable. I like to start with the accounts receivable one. We just determined that they owe us $80. Let's credit accounts receivable for the full amount. They'll owe us nothing. The debit to cash will be for exactly that, more than that, or less than that. You decide the amount of cash will be for less than that. We're granting them the discount because they paid on time. The customer owed us $80, but we were granting them a 1% discount if they paid on time. 1% of $80 is 80 cents. The actual check that we receive from them is $79.20. So we debit cash for $79.20 credit accounts receivable with 80 and it leads me to the same old question I've been asking you. But I thought debits and credits had to equal. And you say, 
they do. And I say, they don't. You say, they will, and I ask you, when? Those will agree when we debit sales returns, I'm sorry, sales discount. When we debit sales discount. It's a sales discount for 80 cents. It's sales discount rather than some other choice because we're the seller. It's sales discount debit because this is doing its job. It was invented for such a time as this. It was invented to decrease sales by the amount of the cash discounts that we're granting. It's debit sales discount because it's contra sales. And debits and credits have to equal. That's what it takes to get this entry in balance. I'm going to do the have a nice day thing. So